it's starting 15 minutes early.
Can you hear me? So you can hear me through the microphone? Yes, I can hear you. But uh, hey, it says it's already recording. <clears throat> yeah, I accidentally press record, and if I stop it, I'm afraid that it won't work that way. So I just apologize to Melanie. She'll have to edit out the first 15 minutes of the audio of the video. Um, she can edit out the she can edit it off the front and the back end. She cannot edit off or edit the middle of it. Did you get all that? <coughs> did Sanford go to the field yesterday? And how did that go? Good. Okay, so we got about, I'll let him in the room in a few minutes, but we have some time. Look what I have on here. My favorite higher power. A lot of new names on there. <clears throat> well, that one family's... <clears throat> Got some interesting computer issues. Yeah.
Maybe, yeah. Um, not a lot, but I'm okay. I have a weekend off. I've been working on taking weekends off. You know the drill. Yeah, I'm really going to... In fact, I had somebody that was asking to meet with me, and I almost offered Saturday or Sunday, and I just thought, no, I'm not going to do it. Trying to get back into some better health care with food and just good sleep and not drinking. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. I'm starting a cleanse, which I have done many times and which I can do because I'm kind of good at all or nothing. I'm starting a cleanse for two weeks starting on Tuesday. So it's a juice for lunch, a juice for dinner, and then a light salad for, excuse me, a juice for breakfast, a juice for lunch, a green juice for breakfast and lunch, and then two small vegetable snacks, and then a light salad, and it works like a cleanse. And it's just a really good jump start. Okay, I'm going to let them in the room, <clears throat> make sure they can hear me. How do I let them in the room again? Let's see. I forgot how to do that. That's going to be interesting, huh? Oh, here it is. Hi, everybody. I just want to make sure. In fact, I want to try two things for the next couple of minutes. Um, let me know that you can hear me because we've been having microphone problems. So just type in one or two. You just type in yes. And then, Lindsay, I want you to moderate that and pass it on to me. And I want to see what it looks like. I got you. Thank you, guys. Send was on send one of those on to the chat moderation. Oh, that's much better. I know what I've been doing wrong all this time. Okay. Perfect. Now I see. Perfect. All right, folks, give me one minute to kind of gather myself and then we'll begin. Somebody said it's a bit of an echo. Is that the case for all of you? For any of you? Okay. All right. Great. Great. All right, here we go. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Pro Program's broadcast. My name is Dr. Brad Reedy. I'm the clinical and co-founder of Evoke Therapy Programs. Tonight's broadcast is on fears and insecurities. And I really found this one f fun, enjoyable to kind of redevelop and, and recreate. It's, so, it's one of our old ones. And it really comes from an assignment in the field. This is something that we ask our clients and students to do, which is to write an assignment and talk about their fears, fears and insecurities. 
on occasion. And we asked them then to share that in a group with other people. I remember I had a young student years ago ask me about kind of naming this and, and, and giving words to it. And is that not focusing on it? Is that not going to create it to become larger than it already is? And I think that that's a common fear that people have about it is that the more we focus on and, and give a name to our fears and our insecurities, that the more power it will have over us. And one of the things that we'll be talking about tonight is that it really has the opposite effect. In fact, one of the things that I talk about often is the more we can we can make friends with our wounds, the more we can make friends with our, our symptoms, with our with our mental illness, if you will, the less power it has over us. It is when we try to block it out, when we try not to think about it, when we imagine that we can easily or quickly or even not so quickly cure it, that it ends up becoming a problem for us. So becoming friends with, giving it a name, remaining on speaking terms with those parts of us that are, are frightening and uncomfortable, that's an important part and, and a theme of tonight's broadcast. So let me set the stage for some of the things that we're going to be talking about. This first idea that, that I've already talked about is that, that they actually lose power. There's a phrase in the 12 steps, a slogan in 12 step meetings that you might hear that says, you're only as sick as your secrets. And what they mean about that is the less we bring things into the light, oftentimes it's, it's our, it's our shame that causes it to go into to the darkness, our fear that other people are going to reject us or judge us, that that becomes toxic for us. And that is why in the 12 step program, one of the steps is to write a fearless moral inventory. And then the next step is to share that with at least one other person so we can get it out. So we can start having a, pro a profound control over us. The best part of what I wanted to talk to you folks about tonight, you parents tonight, is this idea that the best, and I think this is actually true in marriage and all relationships, the best thing that you can do, the best way that you can encourage or, or facilitate change in other people, you can think about it in terms of your children if that helps, is to model vulnerability ourselves. And for so many parents over the years, they're afraid that this vulnerability, that this modeling, maybe even writing their own letter of awareness, right? Writing their own accountability letter. They, they've been afraid that if they admit to their issues, their falls, the, their, their contributions, that they're afraid that their children can use it against them. <clears throat> what I've said for many years now is that a, a letter of awareness or a letter of accountability, a kind of a confession letter, if well written and intentionally written, can't be used against you because you're not asking for anything in return. So, so as we do this work in our relationships, modeling vulnerability only becomes a problem, right? We only end up in a problem in relationships when we're expecting or demanding or requiring some kind of response. But when it comes out of a place of abundance and a place of generosity, it, it can't be used against us. I'm gonna to talk tonight about the relationship between fear and control. This is probably one of the most uh, common themes that, that parents with children that are struggling deal with. I think we all have it with all of our children, uh, the, the fear of, of their choices, the fear of their mistakes, the fear of how they're going to turn out. And that gets amplified many fold when our children are struggling with mental health and addiction, right? They, they give us good reason to be afraid. Tonight, I'm going to talk about really that fear being kind of the enemy. That doesn't mean that you don't feel it. This is important. It doesn't mean that you don't feel fear. I will say to you, it's well-earned and well-deserved in all cases. It comes from somewhere. But it can be a barrier to effective, creative, authentic parenting. And then, of course, what comes out of fear is control. Right? We... we when we're afraid of something, when we're afraid of somebody, how, how they're going to respond to us, we lie. When we're afraid of how somebody's going to react or, or what the outcome is, we try to control it. And we can look at through over, over many dis different disciplines that control takes away our power, it takes away our creativity. 
talking about the, the idea of inviting or encouraging change in our children, part of what I'm talking about tonight is this idea that when we lower our defenses some, when we start to look at ourselves, start to take a, accountability and responsibility for our unhealthy contributions to a dynamic, we, we model it for our children and we end up helping them supporting them and lowering their walls. I asked this question at the outset tonight. I often ask this question of clients that I work with over the years. And the question is, what if you were okay? What if as a human being, you were, you were okay? How then would you respond to things? And, and while very few of us have an experience of being okay enough and feeling safe enough, it gives us a, a reference point. When I think about my response to my wife or to my children and, and where, where I'm responding on the continuum of healthy versus unhealthy, I go back to this idea. In fact, I did it this morning in a conversation with my wife. I was starting to feel defensive. And, and, I, and I had this, this idea in my mind, you're okay. You're okay. Nothing's wrong with you. You have no ill intent. And you can just tell the truth and let her have a reaction. One of my favorite characters in all of storytelling is Yoda. And so I borrowed some of his wisdom for tonight to begin the broadcast. This first quote is from Yoda. It says, named must be the fear before, before banish it, you can. In other words, we have to come to terms with our fear before we can address it, before we can move through it. I love this quote. This is actually the one I was looking for when I was creating the, the, the presentation tonight, and I found some other ones. Fear is the path to the dark side. It's the entry point. He talks about it leading to anger and to hatred, but fear is what blocks the light in all of us. It's the opposite of faith. It, it's, it's the simple opposite of love. And again, Remember, it's not, I'm not saying don't feel afraid. You have good reason to feel afraid, but you cope with it. You deal with it so that it doesn't come into the relationship with other people. This one, train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. So this is about letting go. This is about learning to let go of outcomes. I think about it in terms of when I was in Little, little League and I was a pitcher and I would start the game off. If things were going well, I would have a great game as a pitcher. But the minute I started to struggle, I started to get afraid or anxious. And my control vanished. I found that with tennis. I found that with, with golf. I found it with basketball. That when I get afraid or nervous, I lose my accuracy. And so part of it is trusting your throw. Trusting your truth. Those who attend Al-Anon or CODA meetings will tell you those who are working in that program will tell you that the more they, they come to terms with and deal with their fear, the more able they are to tell the truth. The more able they are, more capable they, they are of setting boundaries. The better they are at showing up authentically. And so we, we've got work to do around our fear. We have it because of our childhood wounds. We has, have it because of the events in, in our lives with our children presently. And so it becomes a project that we need to work on, not in relationship to the child, but in relationship to ourselves. I'm going to use, as of course I, I often do, I'm going to use the motif of the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's idea. This slide was actually taken from a, a great movie that I recommend to everybody I know, let alone the parents that I work with. It's called Finding Joe, referring to Joseph Campbell. Finding Joe is available on iTunes, or on Amazon. I'm not sure if it's available on Netflix yet or not, but it is a, a, a documentary that, that talks about the development of Joseph Campbell's theory. He was a modern philosopher, American philosopher, where he studied all of the world's myths and, and religions and, and great epic stories. And he developed this, this or, or found in all of them this, this pattern. You can think of it as an algorithm where there are these elements that are 
present. Storytelling, when you study storytelling and screenwriting, you learn about the hero's journey. Star Wars was largely influenced by the hero's journey, by Joseph Campbell's seminal book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And it talks about this journey that we go on, go on in our lives. And we go on them more than once. And there is this specific part of the journey where we come face to face with what he calls the dragon. And the dragon represents everything we fear. And, and, and the dragon is uniquely created for you and by you. There's a story that all of our students are asked to read called The Knight in Rusty Armor. Again, a very easy read. I would encourage all of you that are interested to read it. And is the story of a knight who can't take off his armor. So he has to go on a quest, a hero's journey to take it off. And he has to go through various challenges and castles to, to learn how to take his armor off. And the last castle that he arrives at is the castle of Will and Daring. And, and before he gets to the castle of Will and Daring, he faces the dragon of fear and doubt. Along their journey, every hero encounters a dark and difficult space, faces something that they fear, and feels at least for a moment defeated by the forces they are battling. In the knight in rusty armor, the knight faces the dragon of fear and doubt. When the hero faces their dragons, fears and doubt, this is when the hero finds within their greatest power, within their greatest power and strength. Sometimes our thoughts, feelings, or experiences seem as threatening and as real as a live dragon. So this dragon in these stories becomes the motif for our greatest fears. I just saw, I just finished my vacation and I was in New York City and, and saw a wonderful musical for the second time. I took my, my son and my wife back to see it, something called Hades Town. And there's this story about a character going to get going down to Hades to, to rescue his girlfriend. It's a, it's a long story from Greek mythology, but the, the powerful part of it is as he's walking down to, to retrieve his girlfriend, the, the fates are whispering in his ear. Who do you think you are? Why, why do you think you can do this? And that's the kind of thing that we face in our lives. So many times we face that fear that we're not enough. We face it in parenting all the time. It's what prevents us from going deeper into our work. So many people, when I talk about and I, and I, I implore, not just the, the parents at our program, but everybody that I talk to, I actually implore other programs, even other wilderness programs, please invite your families, your parents specifically to do deeper work. It's the most important and valuable thing that they can do to help and support their children. But the fear for everybody is that going into that deep and dark place, that, that we're not going to be able to come out of it. That we're not going to be able to, to recover from it. That we're going to face things that, that frighten us and, and that compromise us. So your children have that same fear. That's why you had to they had to be compelled in many cases to come to our program because they weren't willing to go go through it on their own they were comfortable distracting and in most cases distracting and escaping to the point of putting their life or at least significant quality of life at risk and so what can you do to best support them in the process is travel a parallel journey for yourself and start to look at your own childhood wounds the, own, the messages that you carry around, the insecurities, the fears that you have, and, and to own them. And to make that project, in many ways, separate from the project of parenting. I encourage parents often to say to their children, the issues that I have, while they might be exposed in the challenges that we're having right now together as a family, they existed long before you came along. And I'm going to be willing, I'm, going to, I'm willing in this process to go back and look at the origin of them. As the knight approaches the castle of will and daring, he feels confident at first, but instantly he becomes fearful, unsure when he must face the scariest dragon he's ever seen, he's ever seen the dragon of fear and doubt. 
We ask you to write about your fears and doubts, to, to journal about them. We ask your, your children to do the same. The assignment looks like this. Things I don't like about who I am. Things I worry that other people might think of me. The reasons why I think other people might not like me. Things I don't like about the way that I look. Things I sometimes tell myself, even if they make me feel bad about myself. Things I'm afraid of. Things I think I'm not good at. Leaning into that work. Exposing it. And, and I, even as I read this, this assignment, it's so powerful because you can, you, can, you can just hear that the more that you talk about that, the, the less power that they will have in their lives. One of the assignments that I would often go through with families at the graduation process is I would say, I would tell the parents, tell your child what you think is the best way to manipulate you. Teach your child about your Achilles heel. Teach them the, the ways that you're going to be most triggered by them, the, the most apt, the most likely to, to, to capitulate. And parents would often look at me saying, I don't want to give him that, that ammunition or her that ammunition. And first I would say they already have it unconsciously. But let's name it. Let's name it. I'm afraid you're going to abandon me. I'm afraid you're going to withdraw your love from me. I'm, going to, I'm afraid you're going to think I'm a bad mother or father, unloving, uncaring, selfish. I'm afraid you're going to accuse me of being things that I thought my parents were, and I don't want to be that. You can imagine the power that comes when a parent is willing to put that on the table. And again, it has less power. It has less power when you name it. This, this next slide, this next set of ideas is what I call refrigerator magnets of wisdom. From FDR, his first inaugural uh, address, he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That's, that's the whole motif in, in, in religion in many ways. It's the whole motif in, in Star Wars. Fear is the enemy. It's something to be dealt with. It can inform you, but if it if it leads you, if it drives you, if it gets itself in the driver's seat, there's just no way to be effective. I'll tell you another story about fear and how it blocks creativity. And, and Brene Brown talks about this all the time. I read a book that my son recommended to me. My son's an artist. And he recommended me this book called Art and Fear. I think it's wonderful. If you want to read another book from another perspective, if you have an artistic bone in your body, and I don't really, but I, I read it because my son asked me to, Art and Fear. And there's this great uh, story in there of, of one of the authors. He was teaching a ceramics class in college. And he arbitrarily divided the class in two. And the first half of the class, he said, you are going to be graded on the weight, literally, the weight of your finished products. I'm going to put them on a scale and you're going to be graded on the amount of work that you complete. That was group number one, half of the class. Group number two was given the directive, the measure that he said, you're going to be graded on one assignment. Just one assignment. You're only allowed to turn in one, and that's your grade. And at the end of the semester, guess where all the great work came from? Nearly, he writes, all the great work came from that, that first group in the class that were graded on the, the, the mass amount of work that they did. Why? And the theory was because there was no fear involved. Whereas the group that was graded on the one project, you could imagine the anxiety associated with being graded on just one project. But all the great stuff came from the group that had low to no anxiety about it. I love this quote. Everything you want is on the other side of fear. I know it's too early and, and I know some of you might be new and it's too early and maybe even unfair, maybe even irrational to talk about the gifts that this journey, some of you would consider it 
the detour in the journey, but this part of the journey has to offer you the, the goal that is awaiting you. I know that might seem presumptuous and ridiculous to say, but it's true. Over and over and over again, year after year after year in this work, I have families and parents saying over and over again, it's not what I would have wished for. It's not what I hoped for. It's not what I planned for. But it taught me something that I couldn't have learned any other way. And I'm so grateful for it. And those folks have, maybe reluctantly, but eventually, radically accepted what is instead of what should be. You know, we spend a lot of times about this shouldn't be this way. I wish it were different. When we spend time shooting our life away or, or, or wishing it to be different, we miss the wisdom and the gold that that part of our life has to offer. So everything you want is on the other side of fear. Joseph Campbell said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. And then the quote from Yoda, fear is the path of the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. Now, that last part might not make a lot of sense, hate, but but it, it, it's a, it's a, you can think of it as a hatred for the way things are and the suffering that comes out of that. I love this, this picture that somebody shared with me several years ago. Fear is a lie. Somebody told me one, one time that fear stands for false evidence appearing real. Those of us who struggle with anxiety, part of our work is to know that our anxiety lies to us. Joseph Campbell said that when we are invited to, into the hero's journey and we're asked to, to cross thresholds, right? It's like you're looking at a doorway and in that doorway is darkness, shadow. And we're sure that if we walk through that doorway over there, that we will die. In fact, we see dead bodies on the ground in front of the doorway as evidence that everybody who's tried to cross it is dead. We are absolutely sure of it. And Campbell says in some ways you do die. At least this version of you dies. And if we have the, the courage to walk through that, that doorway toward the goal, in this case, the goal of helping a struggling child, old parts in us will die and new parts of us will be reborn. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather feeling the fear and doing it anyway. I learned in my own therapy years ago, I, I really did think, I really did think in my head that therapy was going to be effective enough that I wasn't going to be afraid. And you know, the weird thing is in session, sometimes I'm, I'm feeling virtually no fear because I'm sitting across from this empathic other person accepting and understanding me and, and validating me. And I'm like, sure, I'm okay. What I think and feel is okay. I can remember one moment when it all came to a, to a, to a point for me. There was something I, I wanted to tell my wife that I was feeling or frustrated or, or angry with. And that's hard for me to do. I'm afraid of conflict. I'm afraid she's going to get upset. I'm afraid that she's going to hurt her feeling. I'm going to hurt her feelings. She's going to withdraw her love, whatever it might be. So I'm sitting in session, talking through it with my therapist. And of course, by the end of the session, I'm like, of course, this is a valid feeling. I can tell her how I feel. It's okay. And I walk out of there with, with the utmost confidence. I get in my car, I drive away from the office. 15 minutes later, when I'm getting off the exit, the, the, the freeway exit that leads to our home, five minutes away from home, my thought is, there's no way in the world I'm going to tell her this. And then it hit me. I thought, I'm going to have to do it afraid. I'm going to have to do it scared. I'm going to draw upon that session. And this was not my first session. This was my 500th session. I'm going to draw upon that session, my awareness there, the clarity that I had there, and I'm going to bring it into the present moment, and I'm going to do it afraid. I'm going to walk through that threshold and speak my truth. I don't even remember what it was. I, I came home. I told my wife what, what the thing was that I was thinking or feeling or asking for, and it went effortlessly.
She was fine with it. It could have gone poorly, but I'd built it up in my head because of all that I had been trained and taught growing up. So sometimes you're going to have to do it scared. When you know it's the right thing for you, we know it's part of your truth, your authentic self, you might have to do it scared. The fear is not going to go away. What you will have is enough information and awareness to combat, to equal the fear. Writing down your fears and insecurities. We ask your your children to do it. We ask you to do it. Share them with at least one other person. Somebody that you trust. If that's your spouse, congratulations, that's wonderful. If that's a friend, that's great. If that's your therapist, that's great. If that's your child's evoke therapist, that's great also. You don't have to have it all figured out. You know, one of the things that we're afraid of as parents is that we need to know everything. We're supposed to have all the answers. And that that's a problem. Sometimes it's it's more valuable to show up not knowing. And what I mean by that is you don't know the right answer. And you know what that does? Not knowing the right answer frees you up to know your answer. That's what it does. And there's a difference between the answer, the right answer, and your answer. Practice vulnerability. Walk. We ask all of our families. We don't require it because some wouldn't come. But we ask, we implore all of our families to go to six 12-step meetings. They're free. At the end of this broadcast and every broadcast, I share with you some of the websites that you can go to to find meetings in your area. Go to six. If you learn nothing from it, you know one thing that you didn't know before. You know what it's like to walk into a meeting to strangers sharing some of your dirty laundry, exposing yourself to some degree so you know what you're asking your child to do. How powerful could it be for, for you, all of the, everybody on the, on the broadcast tonight? We have a lot of people here live this evening. How powerful would it be for all of you to walk into your, your Al-Anon meeting, your CODA meeting, your Families Anonymous meeting, your Adult Children of Alcoholics meeting, to walk in there, be scared, introduce yourself, raise your hand when they ask if you're a newcomer. Go through that. And then to write a letter to your child next week saying, I have more respect for some of the things that that we are asking you to do because it's hard. I get it. Practice vulnerability. Make a therapy appointment. Go to an Al-Anon meeting. Introduce yourself. Go to six of them we ask you to. Write some of the assignments. Talk about your own fears and insecurities. Talk about your own contribution to the problem. We fear, parents fear being taken advantage of, and this often leads people to hide. And this hiding is is a is like presenting a false Im- image and feels unsafe to those who are feeling vulnerable. In other words, hiding, putting a mask on, keeping things at arm, arm's length, it really makes other people, and in this case, we'll talk about your child, it really makes them feel unsafe. Your vulnerability will make them feel safer. Give your child the gift of exploring your own fears and insecurities. I talked about this at the outset, this idea of come become friendly with your insecurities uh, and remain on speaking terms with them. And the Godfather, Michael, Michael Corleone, says, keep your friends close, close, but your enemies even closer. And, and, and while that might be literal, in the case of the movie, the mob, if we apply it to to therapy, that means that keep your strengths, your resources, your gifts, keep them close, be aware of them, but keep your weaknesses even closer. Your vulnerability, your insecurities, your your negative self-talk, your your liabilities, keep them closer. And when they're close, they can't, They don't have the power. They can't control you. It's only when we ignore them or imagine that they're gone. Enlightenment in many ways 
is making peace with your dragons. Not, not defeating the dragon, but making peace with it. Finding all of you, like Carl Jung said, I would rather be whole than good. Finding and understanding all of you, even the, 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 the parts that you might find um, unappealing, repulsive, unlovable. Finding and understanding all of those parts of you makes it possible for you to see others more clearly. Carl Jung also said that the best way to understand the darkness of others is to understand your own darkness. And I found that to be absolutely true. Whatever skills and gifts I have as a therapist, or at least the most important skills and gifts that I have as a therapist, whatever those are, came not from my education, but came from doing my own work. Making peace with your dragons means they won't sneak up on you, surprise you, or control you. Facing one's fears means compassionately looking into your past and understanding the context and the messages, which are the origin of the, of the fears and insecurities that we all carry. And this understanding allows us to let go since it's that context that was not the whole truth. Our previous context was not the truth. And that it doesn't exist anymore. And so many of us are trying to, like Alice Miller talks about in her book, The Drama of the Gifted Child, which I'm going to be doing a couple of broadcasts from now. Um, we're trying to fix things that have already happened. We're trying to prevent things that have already happened in our lives. So the take home, go to therapy. I mean, all of this, this dragon talk and this fears and insecurities and kind of the philosophical abstract language, it, it, it translated into kind of practical every day. Go to therapy. Go to some meetings. Talk to friends, mentors. Come out. If you have the opportunity to come out to our parent groups, come there and talk about your story. Be willing to fail. You know, when I'm coaching families, sometimes through the webinars, the broadcast, sometimes when I'm carrying a caseload and I'm coaching families about their, their stuff, they talk about getting in trouble or making mistakes. It's okay. We're not, we're not trying to, to, to punish you, to slap your hand. We're just saying, Let's teach you what it's about. But we all, so many of us grew up in this context where we're, we're trying to get it right all the time and getting it wrong is bad. That, that, that failure is something that we absolutely fear. I've shared this before, but the, the CEO of Spanx, you know, that, that, that clothing accessory Spanx, she says that growing up that her father would ask every night at dinner, how did you fail? Ask the kids, how did you fail? And they were asked to tell stories about how they failed. And when they did, he would celebrate them and, and toast to them. And if they would say, well, we, I didn't fail anything today, he would act mildly disappointed that they hadn't failed. Sigmund Freud said, if you want to teach somebody something, set them up in a situation where they're sure to fail. I think one of the things I've thought of in my career is to help parents embrace the failures as, as much as the the successes. In fact, just today, I was in family therapy today with my 17-year-old son. And he was asking for freedom in a certain area of his life that we had been kind of regulating for him. And I said, I'm willing to experiment with that, sure. And it's not the first time that we've that we've experimented in that area. And, and he said, good. And then he started to talk about how he thought he was going to be successful. And I stopped him and I said, let me, let me be clear. I'm not, I'm not backing off and giving you permission and trying this experiment because I'm 100% sure you're going to succeed. I'm calling it an experiment for a reason because you might succeed and that would be great. And you might fail and that would be great too. And hopefully there's something to learn there. And then he tried to, he was about to tell me why he had confidence. And I said, I don't need to hear this. I don't need to hear why you think it's going to work. And he paused and he stuttered and he said, you're right. I'm trying to to convince you that you're making the right choice. And I said, I don't need that. That was, that was me two hours ago, my family two hours ago, reading books, listening to the webinars and podcasts, parent education about your child specifically, but about also about children and families and, and, and people in general can be helpful. Learning to let go of the people who, who have the people who have judgments about you. Sometimes that can be people very close to you. He, even in your own extended family. Coming to understand that the shoulds, the ought tos, 
the half twos that you have a, a, accepted as as the truth are are the prison that keeps you stuck. Remember that you don't need to be perfect. Your children don't need you to be perfect. If they did, you're doomed and they're doomed. Rather, what they need is they need someone who is comfortable with their own humanness and thus can approach their humanness, their humanness, with kindness and compassion. So I hope that makes sense. I hope you hear this as an invitation. And I'll talk even about, as I go over some of the upcoming slides and events, some of those invitations. Like at the end of every broadcast, we talk about, we ask every family to attend six 12-step support groups. You can go to alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, or adultchildren.org, and go and find meetings in your area that are free. Alateen, go to alanon.alateen.org, is for teenagers, so if there are siblings, who want to go, that's great. I wouldn't necessarily force them to go to that, but that's something that if they want to be supportive or if they're curious about the process, they can go to that. RefugeRecovery.org is a Buddhist-inspired recovery program that is less focused on higher power and has a lot of Buddhist principles in it. You can also go to NAMI.org to find free classes, affordable classes, or free for the most part in your local area. All of these broadcasts are available on the podcast apps, your favorite podcast app. On the iPhone, you just use the podcast app. On Android, we recommend the SoundCloud app. Or on your computer, you can just go to soundcloud.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can follow Evoke by uh, using the handle at Evoke Therapy, or you can find our intensive program by using the handle at Evoke Summit Lodge on Instagram. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs. The Alumni Foundation is available on Facebook. You can connect there. Uh, the Evoke Family Foundation. Um, that's for alumni parents who want to give back, who raise money to help pay for, and they do every year, help several people who can't afford therapy themselves. So if you want to give back, volunteer, participate, donate, you can go there. The Evoke Therapy blog has new content each week. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, largely based on Joseph Campbell's work, is available on Amazon. If you want to do a deep dive into your work, I, I couldn't endorse this more. Could not endorse this more. If you want to know, if you're ready for a deep dive, either an accelerator, if you've already done a lot of work, or a springboard, if you're just beginning, come to the Finding You Intensive. The next one is August 14th through 18th, and you can see the rest of the dates on our website there. Email intensives at evoketherapy.com to register or find out more information. Here's our upcoming parent support groups. I'll be in Southern California on August 11th, in New York City on, on September 9th, and in Chicago on September 17th. We're going to schedule a Bay Area one coming up. Email melanie at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. The next workshop, we ask all parents who can to come out to a workshop. It's a two-day experiential multifamily workshop. Families love it. They, they, they rave about it. The next one is, that's coming up just in a couple of days is full at Entrada. The one after that will be in our Cascades, our Central Oregon program, August 17th and 18th. Contact Melanie at evoketherapy.com for more information. Pursuits trips are for families or young adults. So we just had, uh, actually we had a, a teen go through one just this week um, and then met up at the end with his family. Um, so you can customize it. They're all custom built there. Think of Therapy Light, Reset, um, think of Sober Fun. I'm happy to take any live questions that have come up throughout the webinar. One parent writes, I'm starting to understand that the things kids do best is mimic us. So I know you're correct in the concept of sharing our vulnerability with our children. My question is, if we are exposing all of our weakness and fear, why won't, why won't it overwhelm our children? And why will it uh, actually increase their confidence in us rather than decrease like a leader who is too weak to inspire confidence? That's a great question and a fair question. And let me give a qualifier to that. First off, it's okay to get guidance on that first from your evoke therapist and a home therapist. You have them, but remember you're doing it from a position of strength, not weakness, and they can tell the difference. 
When I talk to my children about my faults and flaws, they can sense I'm not doing it asking them to take care of me. I'm doing it as a gift. I did it in therapy tonight. We were talking about a dynamic in the family, and I said, here's how I've contributed to the problem, and this is where it came from in my family. And it was very clear that that was coming from a place of strength and abundance, not from a place of fear, not from a place of needing for them to take care of, of me. I was not scared when I was saying it. So that's that's where it comes from, and they'll feel that. It's good to be back. Thank you for welcoming me back. This is the second longest I've ever gone this last little stint without doing a broadcast. So I'm glad to be back. One parent writes, I found myself wanting to blame someone for a family situation that went badly because I was afraid it was my fault. Tell me about it. It took me a while to realize that this bad thing just happened and the way it came about made perfect sense for everyone involved. Having nothing but compassion for my children feels so much better. Again, the ability, the willingness to, to, to avoid blame and anger and just experience vulnerability and sadness. I talk about when I talk about, do you all know what was the trigger that finally led Darth Vader to come to become Darth Vader? I know I'm a little bit of a nerd here, but Darth Vader in episode three, the last straw for him is when his wife died. That was the last straw. And he vowed that he would never let anything bad happen again. So Darth Vader wasn't evil. I mean, he gets painted as evil. Darth Vader was trying to solve the problem of pain. Darth Vader said, if I can control everything, nobody's going to get hurt, principally me. That was his solution. Now, because he wears a, a, a black costume and because he blows up planets of innocent people, we identify him as evil. But that's the core element that George Lucas was talking about or teaching about. It was the pain and the fear and the hurt that led to the control. Contrast that with Yoda in the same episode, by the way, episode three, when Yoda realized that all of the young um, Jedis had been murdered. What did Yoda do? And the answer was he cried. He felt it. And that's really the difference, right? We move through and feel our pain. That's what you're asking your children to do, is to feel their pain, feel their emotions. And by the way, we often ask them to start with you. How did mom and dad hurt me? It doesn't mean that you've created all of the wounds or the most primal wound. Maybe true, maybe, maybe not true, but that's where we're going to start. And so you learn to listen and you learn to say to your child, thanks for talking about it. I'm glad you're talking about my pain, about, excuse me, about your pain and about me. So, all right. Thank you for joining us tonight. We had a good, uh, good attendance this evening. So I appreciate it. These will be on the podcast generally the next day by about 11 a.m. Mountain Time. The next one will be this Tuesday, this upcoming Tuesday, the 23rd at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. And I'll be talking about healthy detachment. So please join us for that if that's a topic that interests you. Have a great week. I hope these points of contact are helpful. Take care and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.